Well, hello everyone. I'm Lou Zaccarella, one of the founders of the Intelligent Community Forum. Welcome to No Place But Home, conversations on the COVID-19 crisis with intelligent communities and leaders of the intelligent community movement and the broadband world uh, internationally. This is the fifth in a series of dialogues that uh, we have taken to call the new abnormal. Today, we're gonna to explore what we think might be a coming trend. One that Pat Shu, the executive director of the National Health Resource Center in the United States here, uh, said in a video that, that was posted by us last week, could be the silver lining in this entire uh, COVID and COVID related crisis. And that is the reemergence of smaller places, including rural communities as an option uh, for perhaps the stabilization uh, of, our, of our culture uh, and our communities. So we're going to be talking about that today. We want to thank ICF Canada for their ongoing support of this series. Um, and before I introduce the panel that you see around me here, I want to bring you some facts from, from my home. Uh, today is June 17th, 2020, and I'm coming to you from uh, Eastern Long Island uh, for the first time in the series. We left New York City on Thursday after watching it move from being the epicenter uh, of and the state with the highest rate uh, of COVID cases and transmissions to the lowest transmission rate of COVID in the United States. And so uh, New York showed uh, how tough it really was and uh, literally bent the curve with, with its own hands. So we're very proud of that. Um, and we hope it continues. It has been 187 days now since the late Dr. Li Wenliang uh, posted a blog about a new pneumonia he had identified in his city, mm -hmm. Wuhan, China. There were 80,000 reported cases uh, at that time, and that was December 30th. Uh, since that time, there have uh, been 434,796 deaths globally. That's as of uh, midnight last night, June 16th. As of last night, the United States reported 118,710 deaths and Canada 8,213. Uh, the outbreak has really compounded major economic and social issues. Uh, we have seen the uh, economic collapse, uh, GDP uh, drop, um, and I suspect that's what will happen when you pull the plug on uh, trillion dollar economies around the world. And then of course the uh, murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis uh, here in the United States and the outrage and social unrest that it has sparked has really created a confluence uh, of issues that have come to the fore. And so again, we're going, to, we're going to explore where we are now with all of that and to see where we can go forward uh, in terms of building our communities at many different levels in a way that's very good for the ICF because we, look, we always have liked to look at communities as cultures, as, as place where everybody has to be brought along and where everyone has to share in that prosperity. And again, the, uh, the four people you see around you have been working on this and thinking about this uh, for their entire careers. So let me introduce them to you. Uh, Dan Cercelli is the president of Connecting Windsor Ex Essex. That's a nonprofit organization with over 40 members, uh, companies, associations, councils, and organizations. Uh, in that county of Essex County, Ontario. Dan is an expert at creating collaborative teams that implement and advocate intelligent community initiatives throughout that region. Windsor, Essex, the city of Windsor and Essex County in which it's uh, residing was named a top seven intelligent community in 2011. Dan, welcome. Thank you very much. And I, I love your map. I, I feel like you're going to give me a weather report uh, for tomorrow. It's not hand Island. painted. It's not hand painted, but it's uh, it's some good work we did anyway. Bill Coleman uh, is a founder of Community Technology Advisors, where he helps community. He assists uh, clients to develop and implement programs of broadband infrastructure, uh, investments, and technology training. Bill believes both are required for community technology and economic vitality, and he was one of the first to be thinking about this. Before this career, Bill managed uh, Envoys, now Zao, I believe, uh, integrated community network rural market development efforts. Bill has dozens of credentials, 
uh, in the state of Minnesota and elsewhere, where he successfully brought the intelligent community movement and method and works with uh, dozens of communities, uh, rural communities in Minnesota. Bill, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Lo. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to see you. And, uh, you know, you're, you're considered one of the gurus of the rural intelligent community movement. So we're delighted that you can make the time. Wendy Dupley, above Bill, is the uh, Director for Economic Development for the City of Maple Ridge, British Columbia, Canada. Wendy is a strategic, uh, visionary, and very creative uh, leader with global experience in private and public sector investments, uh, environments, I should say. Her ability to develop strong partnerships and focus on specialty areas such as identifying key economic indicators and successful workforce strategies are among the skills that she brings to this part of British Columbia. And Wendy, it's great to see you again. Yeah, it's great to see you. Good to see everybody. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I should say, Wendy was also responsible for leading uh, the community where she last worked, Abbotsford, British Columbia, into the top seven. So we have people representing intelligent communities here. And now we're going to go up uh, a, few, um, a few thousand feet to the satellite industry. And, and my friend Dave Rabin is here. Dave is the vice president with Hughes Network Systems, where he leads the company's global marketing of broadband products. Dave develops uh, the company's market strategy and guides the strategic direction of that formidable international sales force. Uh, Mr. Rabin speaks frequently on Satellite Solutions' strongest portfolio of community successes in providing uh, strategies that relate to uh, broadband. Among his technology credentials, uh, he supported engineering development of TDMA, very small aperture terminal, or we call them VSAT in the satellite industry, satellite network projects. Uh, Dave is also a big thinker, again, who has brought Hughes into the intelligent community space. And we're very anxious to speak with him about the possibilities of broadband as the rural uh, environment emerges. And Dave, again, uh, really appreciate you making the time for us. It's a pleasure to join you, Lou, and uh, I look forward to talking about satellite. Okay. Well, we always like to talk about satellite. Um, I was going to turn this over at this point to my colleague, John Young, but he unfortunately could not make it today. Uh, he will be with us next time. Uh, but we do want to thank ICF Canada uh, for their support uh, of this series. Okay, let, let's get ourselves located. I, I mentioned that I'm in eastern Long Island, uh, situated um, near the Atlantic Ocean um, in Suffolk County, where um, the Shinnecock Nation uh, is a few miles down the road, and there are a cluster of small villages here. Uh, our COVID-19 situation, uh, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, has been significantly reduced. Wendy, where are you today? And what's your situation with COVID? Yeah, thanks, Lou. Uh, yeah, we're 45 minutes from uh, Vancouver, a uh, community called the city of Maple Ridge. Um, the situation in the province has uh, really been quite a successful uh, endeavor, I think, flattening the curve, pretty much like your story, Lou, in New York, uh, the, the province has done exceptionally well. Uh, we've really had um, very limited cases over the last few weeks cropping up. Our um, concern really in the community going forward is that we have uh, trends down in Washington State, which are still having fairly high numbers every day and a great number of deaths. So that's our neighbor to the south. And then our neighbor to the east, the province of Alberta, is again trending upward with its caseload. So that's giving us a lot of concern. We just did a provincial poll across the province and it seems that people are taking this pandemic less seriously now. I think since we started to restart, uh, people are getting maybe a little bit uh, too comfortable in some cases and not necessarily taking the precautions that they were a couple of months ago. So that certainly is um, something that is on our radar at a provincial level. Okay, very good, thank you. And yeah, we, I guess we do see a, a bit of a casual nature now as, um, as we move further from this. 
Um, Bill, how about you? Where are you today and uh, what's your situation with COVID-19? I'm at my home in Matamidi, Minnesota, which is just north of St. Paul. And uh, Minnesota has struggled with COVID. Uh, we've had pretty strict uh, restrictions by the governor on closures, but we've struggled with uh, long-term care facilities for our elderly people. And we've also got a lot of food processing, meat packing, poultry, beef, pork, uh, all of which have uh, struggled uh, with, uh, with uh, safety. And people there working very close together there's a, a, it's a very tough place to work and, and a lot of uh, new Americans live or you know, work in those plants. So East African immigrants and uh, Hispanic folks. And uh, so it's a, a real challenge for cultural reach out to those communities to on the education and trust. Uh, so there's uh, people need to work to get paid and many of those people are in very tenuous situations. So that's a real challenge for us. And then as you mentioned uh, with George Floyd, you know, that happened in my hometown of Minneapolis and and uh, it was distressing to see and now distressing to deal with in terms of, you know, we've had a combination of protests which uh, you know certainly support and then riots which I'm not uh, big on but as we see more and more, a lot of that rioting was not the people worried about George Floyd. It was other people creating mischief in the middle of the night. And uh, uh, But I think the, there's a lot of fatigue in our community now dealing with both the COVID and the social unrest. They say there's $500 million of damage in the Twin Cities with uh, buildings destroyed. And uh, so there's... You know, people are trying to, you know, uh, control their own actions and feel secure in their homes. And uh, it's a real challenge. Yeah. And, and I want to circle back, Bill, because I want to talk about the impacts on the economies to this and what the response has been to what happened you know, in Minneapolis and other cities. And, you know, just maybe to get a snapshot of you know, those essential workers, right? There were no more essential workers than people who were providing food to us in the cities during this crisis. So maybe in our next question, we can touch on that a little bit, but uh, thank you for that. Dave, where are you today? And what's your situation there? Yeah, I'm, I'm in a um, suburb of Washington, DC. Um, I'm actually at the Hughes facility. Um, our, our, our jurisdiction has been uh, you know, the whole Washington, D.C. area has been pretty impacted. Uh, so we've been pretty well shut down until just a couple of weeks ago. But a couple of weeks ago, we entered into um, phase one of, of the reopening. Um, and, and that's, you know, one measure of that is that, you know, restaurants can serve people outdoors. Uh, we're actually going to be going into phase two come, come this Friday. Um, but right now, I'm, I'm at, at Hughes. Uh, we're we're an essential business because we're in the business of telecommunications. And um, so we've had a, a small staff uh, who've come to work uh, every day, but just recently we've started, um, you know, opening up for people such as myself to, to come into work. Dan, how about the situation in Windsor, Essex? So uh, as you mentioned, Lou, I'm in, uh, I'm in Windsor, Essex. I actually live in uh, the town LaSalle. Uh, working out of my home and fortunate enough to be working out of my home since uh, the middle of March. And our COVID situation has been stabilizing uh, and we're doing a, our leadership's doing a great job uh, for the region. We've just recently had an unfortunate uh, incident with some uh, migrant workers that come to the Windsor Essex region uh, during the uh, heavy agriculture time and there was unfortunate uh, loss of life for some uh, young men uh, which has ramped up uh, some testing in our agricultural uh, community uh, but again I think our leadership is doing a good job and uh, are quickly working to uh, get some control of the situation but much like Wendy spoke about 
you know, there's, there's this air of easing. People are anxious to get back to the previous normal and it doesn't take much uh, to be reminded uh, that uh, we're not ready. Uh, there's still much to be learned about this and we need to be cautious and be taking our steps and uh, really proud of our provincial leadership, uh, not rushing uh, us into what is what they're calling the stage two. So our region remains in uh, stage one uh, for the time being. Okay. Now just, I just so that, uh, some of our international, well, just viewers in general, uh, just quickly on this, the um, geography of Windsor, Essex, and the industrial geography as well. I think people know uh, Windsor, Canada as an automotive center. Of course, you're right across the Detroit River from America's uh, automotive capital, uh, Motor City, Detroit. Um, you've got a big casino up there, which I'm, I'm yes, guessing is is closed. Um, Very quiet. Yeah which is a driver for your economy. So those two things are, are kind of down now. But you've also got an enormous uh, rural sector as well. Just Can you give us just a snapshot of Windsor and then Essex County so that people get a picture of uh, what you're over? Yes, so geographically, Windsor, Essex is the most Southern part of uh, Canada. We are in the Southwestern part of Ontario and uh, Pelee Island, uh, Point Pelee is the most Southern part of Canada uh, completely. I think we're actually more Southern than where you may be uh, right now, uh, Lou. Um, and then as you mentioned, uh, uh, right across uh, the border, right across the river is Detroit, Michigan. And here's a little interesting factoid for everyone. Detroit is North of Windsor, Ontario. Right. So. Whenever we have American guests in Windsor, I'll often remind them, if you get lost, just remember this one thing, Detroit is north. And that uh, always gets some good laughs and uh, a lot of raised questions. But right. uh, yeah, that's where we are uh, geographically, uh, geographically. And as you mentioned, uh, typically our region is associated with being the automotive capital of Canada. And, uh, but to your point, we also have a tremendous amount of rural area and we are a very strong agricultural uh, area as well. Very good. Um, you know, Bill, I wanted to uh, circle back with you on that, uh, the issue of the primary impacts of COVID, um, any social dislocation, you started to describe some, um, maybe not direct social unrest in the rural communities, but I, I want to get a sense of their response to it and uh, perhaps how connectivity might be tying into that or amplifying it. Well, I think there's, um, uh, Minnesota has got a uh, diverse ecosystem and diverse economy in our southern part of our state. We're very agricultural, corn and beans and lots of animals. As you move north, it uh, turns more uh, tourism and recreation in the North Woods. And um, uh, so in different parts of the state, dealing with very different issues. I mentioned the food processing. And you know, when your food processing is kind of like manufacturing, except your components you just can't store in a warehouse. You have animals mm -hmm. that are growing they get to a certain point and they need to be harvested and uh, processed. And that's been a tremendous impact. The fact that the meat processing plants are closed, the animals really can't stay in the farm. So there's been huge, you know, uh, uh, killing and disposal of, of animals in the area. So that's, so the money just stops them. And so that's the lost production and, and so on. And then in, as summer emerges now in Minnesota, our northern areas are uh, very tourism oriented. And so last week uh, in one northern county along Lake Superior, the, uh, somebody took a chainsaw and cut down a huge red pine tree right across the highway to stop people from traveling into their county. <laughs> so it's a, a very, the resorts of course want people to come but the people who live there, which just soon people from the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, stay home. Yeah. Uh, they have limited healthcare uh, facilities there, just a 10 bed hospital, 
Uh, and so it's a, the idea of people bringing the virus to their community is very threatening to many, especially retirees who live there. And so it's a real cultural uh, fight really even between, within the community, uh, open or closed is a, a big challenge. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, you know, when we were in the city, we were uh, debating whether to come out here again, which is a very uh, small communities and so forth. And we actually decided that we wouldn't, they didn't, they, we sensed they didn't really want us and we didn't want to do that to them. So uh, uh, you mentioned connectivity. And I yeah. think that is a uh, uh, people now that many of our Northern counties uh, have some good uh, fiber to the home connectivity along uh, Lake Superior that uh, people say, hey, I can go now live and work in that county during the COVID escape the urban environment and go to their generally summer homes and uh, stay there and work. And so uh, that's another driver of an influx of people. Uh, the general approach of those counties was to ask people to isolate for at least 10 days after arrival in the county. Many stores did not let uh, non-locals into their, like into the grocery store or the hardware wow. store. Interesting. Well, we'll, you know, I saw Dave uh, smile when you said that about connectivity. So we'll, we'll circle back with him. But Wendy, um, your situation in terms of dislocation, social unrest, um, things that you've noticed, you know, uh, began to look a little bit differently as, as COVID and then the economy collapsed and, and social unrest entered uh, other parts of Canada. Did it, did it impact Maple Ridge and Ridgely and those communities uh, yeah. where you are? Yeah, I mean, really, uh, hearing what Bill had to say, a lot of similarities uh, in the early days, getting a handle on the outbreaks in the long-term care facilities were really critical to us in British Columbia. It's been our largest percentage of deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities, food processing facilities right across the province. We've had outbreaks we've had to deal with in a number of those facilities. Um, you know, in, in Alberta, the province to the east, the Cargill plant, um, again, exactly the same issues as what Bill has talked about, migrant workers, difficulties in getting health and safety procedures in place. So a lot of really, uh, really good synergies with what Bill's been saying, really. So I won't go much into those. I would say uh, British Columbia is an extremely diverse economy, and that's really um, been a little bit and will be a bit of our saving grace going forward. Uh, huge focus, of course, on technology as a province. Um, you know, locally, we're developing that technology attraction strategy. Uh, connectivity, I think, for everybody has really come to the forefront. Uh, certainly across the province, the provincial government has had a department for some time that has focused on uh, connectivity in rural communities. Uh, that small branch was located in a, a citizen services ministry. And uh, just as some indication, really, they have moved that department out of there and located it into the main economic development and the jobs and the skills and the labor force ministry focused on all that. Uh, so that's an indication of how much they've recognized um, that broadband and getting that connectivity out in the rural communities has become so critical through this. And there's one thing I just wanted to share that is quite unique to um, British Columbia, which people may or may not be aware of. We've, um, we've had a number of issues with opioid deaths. Um, and certainly in the last part of last year and the beginning of this year, that was really what was hitting the news all the time, the number of opioid deaths. Then, of course, COVID came along and we really sort of took our eye off that ball and everything became focused around COVID and our response to that. And uh, they've just issued the latest opioid deaths uh, for the province and more people have died in the month of May than throughout all of COVID-19. 
So um, when we talk about social challenges, that's certainly one that as a province we need to be focused on. Uh, with the reaction to what happened in Minneapolis and George Floyd, um, there's been a number of very large protests in Vancouver. Um, thousands and thousands of people have gathered uh, social distancing sort of went out the window to some extent and a few people wore masks, some didn't. Um, but what's been particularly interesting in this particular instance is we've also seen protests happening in the mid-sized cities, um, which wouldn't normally happen, you wouldn't normally see. But to see that spill out happening in communities like Abbotsford, where you don't necessarily see protests, I think is something um, that is very interesting about how passionate people feel about this topic. Yeah, and that's a that's a really good snapshot. And you know, you describe deaths by despair, but also I suspect diversity as well is driving a lot of the uh, feeling of social in, in injustice. Um, but you know, both you and Bill have alluded to connectivity sort of being now pushed as uh, or more mandated because it's obvious what it can do. Um, Dave, I'm going to turn over to you. Um, in the case of Hughes specifically, has demand for broadband in rural communities increased in any way? And have you seen its usage or application uh, change at all over the past, let's say, 120 days or so? Uh, yeah, um, it, usage has increased quite a bit. Um, but but before I go there, let, let me just give you just a, another perspective on um, unrest and, and dislocation. You know, we, we provide services uh, throughout the Americas, in, including South America. And, um, you know, uh, in, in places like uh, Peru and, and Ecuador, we've been unable to add new customers because of the, the, the government lockdown has been just so complete. Our installers have not been able to to go out to communities and, and in, install terminals and, and therefore provide service. And then we also provide uh, community Wi-Fi in a number of places and our ability to add new community Wi-Fi centers in Mexico and Colombia uh, have been impacted by um, villages. You know, these are small places, very remote. And um, we, we've had instances where uh, our engineers were prevented from entering town. There's a barricade, uh, I think kind of what, you know, I heard before, a barricade where they don't want outsiders coming in. Even if you're going to install broadband, turn away and, and go back. Um, so that, that's the kind of disruption that, that, that we've seen. But, um, you know, for, for our, um, our HughesNet, con, you know, internet service, um, it, it's, th this whole uh, pandemic has is, is really increased uh, demand for the service and increased usage as well. So a, a lot of our network is is operating at at full capacity, and and that's not just the U.S. but but also uh, in in South America, Brazil, um, Colombia, uh, Chile. We've just seen very strong uh, demand. So a lot of the challenge for us has been in um, managing the high demand. Uh, and making sure that we're doing the right prioritization of services. So um, online education works and, and cloud-based business applications uh, function properly. Um, and, and of course, as, as, a, as a service, we've also uh, signed, in, in the U.S., the FCC has a, uh, something called a, a Keep right. America Connected Pledge, which says, you know, hey, if you're a service provider, you're going to continue providing service even if somebody's unable to pay their bills. And as you know, we're one of the many service providers who, who've, um, who've committed to that. Um, so we, we've seen a big impact on our service offering. Yeah, Dave, is, is it been that people are, con uh, well, who's been driving the service? Has it been sort of policy government driven uh, because, of, because of the economic uh, aspects uh, of, the, of the COVID uh, fallout? Or has it been, you know, individuals saying, you know, you know, my kid's got to learn if he doesn't stay with his school at, at this level, 
you know, he's going to fall behind. What, have you looked at any in, uh, economic indicators as to what's really pushing that? Because if it's policy, it's going to be more permanent, right? If well, it's cultural, it may be more, less. Yeah. So the, you know, COVID in the context of things, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really only talking a few months, you know, really since, since February. Um, so the demand that I'm talking about uh, is really from individuals, people, you know, uh, making decisions with their own wallet. Governments work in a much longer, uh, generally speaking, time scale and will, um, you know, implement policies. Um, they take a long time. Um, so, but we, we've been seeing for, for years now uh, you know, governments, you know, predating COVID, obviously, years, um, governments having uh, a, a strong focus on bridging, bridging the digital divide. Um, and and that, that's a no small part due to the desire to increase um, economic growth. Um, I, 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 think, um, I think the World Economic Forum or some group like that had, had calculated that uh, every Every 10% increase in internet penetration uh, results in something like 1.2% GDP growth That's in an cool. area. So, so, so governments, yeah, yeah I, I was one, one of those groups had, had, had done that study. So, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot of governments around the world, and I'm really talking developing countries um, in, in the instance of satellite, um, you know, implementing broadband policies and, and driving connectivity to rural and, and hard to serve areas. Okay, well, I, I want to come back and talk about what, you know, what happens when, you know, Hughes is able to get its broadband uh, into some of those communities where, you know, you've been reporting on uh, best practices like Siberia and, and places like that. So uh, let, let's hold that and come back to it. Um, an interesting insight into what's going on. Uh, Dan, you know, in our previous uh, episodes, uh, John uh, Young put together groups of miners and we, from all over the world, and we, we really talked about what the impacts would be of COVID as it relates to the mistrust of density. That's what we were calling it, and the impacts that it would have. Um, in the near term, you know, as, as Dave says, it hasn't been that long since we've been experience, experiencing COVID, but in the, in the near term, it seems to be almost universally accepted that smaller cities and rural communities may benefit from this. But A, do you agree? And B, is there any evidence of it at this point um, where you're situated? So 100%, I agree uh, for the last six to eight years, uh, Connecting Windsor-Essex has really been advocating for broadband for our entire uh, geography. And uh, we've made some great strides um, over the last uh, three years with a lot of construction projects going on. So, uh, you know, we're made up of a uh, city and a number of municipalities. Three of those municipalities have been able to have broadband expanded into their geography, but we still have four that are poorly served to incredibly underserved. So the uh, CRTC, uh, which is the Canadian uh, Radio Transmission uh, Communications, yeah, CRTC for Canada, uh, basically said in 2016 that uh, broadband is an essential utility for all Canadians. And they actually put a broadband value on that of uh, 50 megabits per second download and 10 megabits per second upload. So if you are falling short of that, um, you have an opportunity to advocate for your, you know, your, your town, your municipality, whatever it is, and say, how do we get, how do we get broadband here? So uh, COVID-19 really made that light very, very bright on those underserved uh, areas. Uh, we were actively engaged with our school board uh, partners to obtain connectivity for underprivileged families as well as underserved uh, families. So we've got uh, exceptional relationships with our wireless carriers and our fiber or coax uh, carriers. And they did remarkable work in a very, very sh in short order in order to get connectivity uh, to those families that definitely need it or, or you know, we're falling with speeds that were just not adequate in order for students 
uh, to maintain study. So not just elementary or secondary students, but even our higher education for, uh, students in our college and our university. So, yeah, are you using satellite for any of the, the delivery service? We've not been using satellite uh, yet. Now, some of the carriers may be using it in some form or another, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not very aware about it. Uh, sorry, uh, Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to make friends. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, and, 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 and by the way, um, you know, we, we've always felt if you can get fiber, that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, yeah. but, you know, our, our mission is to provide broadband where, you know, people aren't getting it, um, you know, wh whether it's by fiber or cable or, or, or whatever means. Um, and, and, and a large part of that is just an economic equation. Um, you know, and as you get more rural, it gets, it gets more and more expensive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bill, um, same question that I started with, uh, with Dan. Um, do you agree that um, there is going to be a benefit to smaller communities uh, as a result of that mistrust of density? And um, I guess in, in the case of the Minnesota communities that you work with, I guess there are about 40 of them at the moment. Are they ready? If, 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 you know, God forbid they should have their prayers answered and they start retaining people, they start attracting development in? You know, I think uh, some communities have great connectivity in rural Minnesota and others have very poor connectivity. And so I think now more than ever that that connectivity, when if somebody decides to move to a rural area, that that connectivity will be so high on the list that those without will really suffer. I think the, one of the things that the pandemic has done is driven the need, we've seen this new technology adoption, right? For 10 years, 20 years, we've talked about telehealth and distance education and work from home. And now in the last 90 days, you know, Zoom penetration now has probably replaced the internet as the fastest adoption of technology. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got everyone from, you know, everyone using these for happy hours and using them for work and school. And so that is, uh, you know, we've really leaped ahead in the use of these technologies and government barriers and insurance barriers to things like telehealth have uh, faded away. That also, you know, the HIPAA requirements aren't as so important anymore. Yeah, they, they melted away quickly, didn't they? The billing procedures, right? And so those melted away and I think it'll be hard for health, those companies to reinstate the former policies. And so I think, uh, so I think that having that connectivity has uh, moved way up on the list. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting with satellite and uh, uh, with the, I don't know, Lou, are you on satellite today? I am not, no, okay, I'm not. You've got, you've got a little uh, connectivity issue there that we can see. With when you talk, but the uh, now the uh, two-way real-time communication with video, that's kind of a tough thing for a satellite connection with the latency. And so the lower satellite now might uh, take care of that in the future. Uh, so it's, uh, but having that wired connection or a solid, very fixed wireless connection is, is really gonna be important. I want to come. I want to come back to it, some of the things you were saying, Bill. But I want to give Dave a chance to talk uh, to respond to the word latency because that's sometimes that's like waving a red flag in front of a bull when you talk to a satellite guy. But uh, it does happen to be the case, right, Dave? Yeah, and you know there 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 is latency with with geosynchronous satellites. You know, those are satellites that appear to be stationary above the Earth, and and, and there's a latency of about half a second or so. Um, you know. But um, you know, with, with video conferencing, yeah, that 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 might may be an issue. But I, I'll, I'll tell you, um, you know, we support a lot of voice, um, and uh, it it works very well. Uh, interestingly, you know, when you talk on your cell phone, you've probably got a hundred to two hundred milliseconds of of delay as as you go through the the mobile network. Um, now, so I. I, I, you know, 
latency is an issue, but I, we, we don't think it's that big of an issue. But more importantly, when, when you look at, well, it, by the way, if it's gaming that you're doing, it's a huge issue. <laughs> you right. know, because that's... Surgery. What's that? Telesurgery. Yeah, well, that I, I don't think I want to get it operated on through a satellite link. I'm not signing up for that. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> People I don't like who I might sign up. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, but you know, I I I think what's important to to our customers mostly is is um you know the broadband speeds and 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 the amounts you know the volume of data. Um, and supporting, you know, video applications. And, and of course, you know, video, things like YouTube and whatnot are the, you know, more than half the volume of, of the, the traffic that, that we carry. Um, and, and that's, of course, latency uh, in, insensitive. But, um, you know, sure, latency is an issue, but um, try it. You'll like it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also providing city services in remote places and, and helping the agricultural uh, industry. I mean, those are all being uh, using satellite applications. Yeah. Um, now. Ooh, just one more thing there. The one thing I would say is that satellite has improved to the extent that it is yeah. better now than many DSL providers oh, yeah, in the rural better. place. Yeah. So I think that is a switch in kind of the hierarchy of connectivity options for many people. Well, you know, and, and that, that's our view as well. Um, you know, it, 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 as I said before, if you've got fiber, that's just absolutely wonderful. Good on you. If you've got good cable, fantastic. But, you know, if you've got DSL, uh, boy, the further, you know, the DSL's, you know, uh, getting long in the tooth. And the further you get from a DSLAM, you know, the, the connection point, the lower the data rates go. And, and so we view uh, anybody with DSL as, as uh, what we consider an underserved uh, um, household. And, and so somebody who we, we think we could go and provide a better service for. Yeah, and, and you know, Bill, just I just wanna go back to what you were saying earlier because you made a lot of important points. And I think Dave provides a springboard to it, which is um, the, the quality of the connectivity is going to be increasingly important. I mean, that's one thing you can certainly take away from all of this. And one of the questions that I asked you, and I'm gonna uh, ask the same thing of Wendy next, are you ready? Um, should, again, there be this flow of people, you know, like myself who say, you know what? I've had it with the city. I don't trust the city anymore. The quality of life is here. I can do, I certainly can do what I do online. Um, if I've got the right connectivity, if I've got the right cultural environment around me, um, are all of those things sort of, do you see them in preparation now or, or ready for what might be a, a growth in uh, the rural? Uh, I would say from a British Columbia perspective, um, we're, we have already been seeing that trend to people moving out to mid-sized cities um, <clears throat> that have seen a lot of growth all around the metro Vancouver and further out region. So the mid-sized cities are the ones that have been benefiting up until this point, because I think people are realizing that now they can work from home through the COVID. They do have all the great facilities and connectivity that they have in the big city. And they can, if necessary, in a short commute, relatively speaking, an hour or less, get into the big city. So those mid-sized cities are certainly seeing the immediate benefits uh, of more residents moving out there. However, when you start to look at the more rural communities, and the question really is, are they ready? And I think that's still very much hit and miss mm. uh, in British Columbia. Uh, very much, I think, as Bill alluded to, some of them are ready, uh, but I agree with the comments that have been made. The connectivity part is top of the list when people are looking for a destination. They have to have good connectivity. So if you're in a rural community and you don't have that, then people are going to scratch you off the list. It's as simple as that. And then you have the people challenge, I call it, in more rural communities, because people um, tend to be a bit more conservative 
um, sometimes not that welcoming of outsiders. And uh, I think people have a lot of choices on where they call home and connectivity is essential as electricity for them. And I know we've talked about that before. We have. And the other thing that, um, you know, Bill Coleman talks about quite a bit and why he's been successful is he's, you know, I would say adapted the ICF philosophy, if not the method altogether, which you have as well. But you talk about a more holistic approach. After connectivity, great. You've got the railroad, you know, running. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to are you going to put lumber on it and cargo or the new railroad brings ideas along? And so, Bill, question to you, uh, again, is, is the holistic approach viable still in the rural communities? And, and, and then I'm going to go to Dan and ask, what are you seeing uh, in your rural communities that are giving you confidence that you're going to be able to retain uh, your best and brightest in your, in your industries? But Bill, first to you on the holistic notion. Well, I think there is a uh, uh, importance to uh, think about this holistically, and I think We've seen um, for many years probably an emphasis on workforce in rural areas as a key thing, and they've worked on that. I think more recently we've seen innovation moving up that list of what can communities do, whether that's, you know, for some, when we work with uh, com rural communities and we talk innovation, you know, some businesses haven't even claimed their Google Place. So if we could get them to do that, that would be an innovation for them but more and more just trying to move people up that ladder of sophistication. I would say the COVID um, has been driven a digital equity initiatives where schools have been forced to realize that, hey, 20% or 25% of our kids don't have either a computer or a connection uh, to the internet. And that happened so quickly that the schools had a week or less to try and figure that out. Yeah. So that's gone up the list. Communi rural communities have always done kind of a good job, or many of them, if they're tourism oriented, on the advocacy and the marketing side of you know giving, creating a brand for their community and pushing that out. I don't think they've thought as much about the interactivity with their own community members as the ICF model now kind of really encapsulates. The thing that rural communities don't really like to think about is sustainability. And I think this goes to Wendy's point of view about the conservative nature that sustainability is seen as government regulation or against coal or green kind of, that is a cost and not a, an efficiency. And I think that's a messaging that we work with to try and help them understand that um, um, how important this is for the productivity, the competitiveness of their own businesses and their own organizations. Mm. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, Dan, looking at those criteria, which Bill has uh, just gone through, that's fundamentally the ICF method step-by-step, step, um, is rural Essex County uh, planning and prepared uh, to take those steps or are you still trying to get the, the connectivity issues and the telehealth issues sorted out the region is really prepared and really ready to start adopting more broadband there they want it uh, for those who don't have it uh, right now they're really feeling that difference um, so they're they're prepared and they're also prepared for i think you were talking about you know that uh, an influx of a population move people saying hey i can i can go live a little bit more rurally, a little bit more remotely. And my expectation to Wendy's point uh, earlier, if people are looking uh, to move into different places, one of those top three questions are, how connected is this home or is this multi-dwelling uh, location? So uh, there, there's a high level of awareness. There's a high level of uh, readiness and uh, I'll be speaking next week at, two, at one of the council sessions in at one of the municipalities about this very this very issue. It'll, it's one that's underserved, and I'll be there speaking through what we're doing to advocate to bring services to them and finding ways to keep engaged with them so that we make sure that we get them uh, connected, but they're all anxious for it. 
you know, and, and it's fundamental to democracy, to the way we live. We, we really have to be communicating in different ways uh, to citizens. And, um, you know, when we don't, we, we certainly pay a price. Dave, I want to stay on this subject of the, the holistic development uh, of a community because you and Vinay Patel uh, did a webinar a few weeks ago, I believe it was, and you presented some terrific case studies of communities where Hughes is working around the world. Um, I, I, obviously, the one in Siberia, the, we've produced a video on that one. Um, that was, uh, that's, a, that's a classic. Talk to us about what you as a provider um, do to sort of encourage that holistic notion or, or maybe give us some snapshots from those best cases that I, I just referred to. So um, as, as, a, as a service provider, um, you know, one of the things that, that we're doing is uh, the community Wi-Fi initiative uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is where we're, we're working with Facebook. Uh, they have a, a connectivity group who, um, you know, they're, they're motivated to get as many people connected to the Internet as possible. And, and they've developed uh, something called Express Wi-Fi, and it's really a back end for managing Wi-Fi subscribers. And, and they go to industry and, and offer this back end uh, for free, for, for no charge. And, and so we, we partner with them. And we're, we're putting in, we put in uh, well over a thousand uh, Wi-Fi hotspots in rural communities throughout South America, Brazil, Mexico, Colombia. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not a free service. It, it's, you know, we, we go to a, um, uh, a village shop, uh, could be, uh, a, a, a clinic, um, you know, any, any place where there's, uh, somebody there is going to look after the equipment and, and help promote the service. And, and, and what we're doing is we're enabling people to buy connectivity by the drink. So you can buy, you know, prepaid, um, megabytes, gigabytes at, at, at reasonable prices. That, that's one thing we're doing. Uh, another thing we're doing in a similar vein, but a different angle, we work with mobile network operators, MNOs, uh, where a, a lot of times, as I mentioned before, it, 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 as you get more and more rural, it's, it's really expensive to run terrestrial connections. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, fiber uh, can cost as, as much as $20,000 a mile or, or actually more. A fiber, um, a, a microwave hop can, can be close to $100,000 depending on, on the conditions. And so we can go to a mobile network operator and, and we can say um, we can drop in a, a satellite link quickly, cheaply, and you can connect that to a base station. Uh, an LTE base station and, and, um, and, and you know, sometime in the future, uh, 5G, and use the base station to offer connectivity uh, throughout a village. Yeah, and you guys um, so are we've doing, done, you're doing, you're doing that in Mexico pretty actively, Oh, uh, Quite a bit, quite yeah. a bit, yeah. Um, last question, um, well, actually, I've just gotten one, but um, predictions. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about inevitable fallouts, um, the possibility that the rural is going to be reborn in some way, shape, or form. Um, Wendy, you know, with regard to maybe looking at the places in British Columbia where you've had experience, what do you think the economic and social fallout will be of this? And define maybe one silver lining that you, you realistically expect to see. Well, I think um, I would say the thing that we're just getting our heads wrapped around now on, as far as fallouts from COVID is what will be the outcome for real estate. So, you know, you've heard major corporations, PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, Google, they're, no, they're just not returning to the regular office space real estate. So right across Western Canada, you have all this office space that's currently vacant. I mean, downtown Calgary is a, a prime example of where it's got critical, actually, the vacancy rate on commercial office space. 
and uh, communities have been focused on building commercial space for some time to attract businesses and now businesses are saying they're cutting their real estate by 25 percent so that has serious implications on um, revenues from municipalities that are stretched enormously to the limit with the amount that's been put on them to deal with covid to deal in BC with the opioid crisis, the homelessness crisis, uh, the amount of uh, extra uh, liabilities really that have been pushed down to the municipal government level without any significant increase in funding is putting pressure right across the board on how are we going to even maintain essential services across the municipality when even municipalities have laid off you know, thousands of workers in British Columbia due to COVID. So there's all this sort of fallout, if you like, that we're currently grappling with on how we go forward at a local government level. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The ability to even provide the services. Yeah. Um, Dan, um, how about you? What would you say will be the fallouts from this? And uh, Wendy didn't give me a silver lining, but I knew she has one in mind. <laughs> I do have a silver lining. I think it comes okay. down to really that, uh, that really what we're benefiting, everybody's benefiting from the options to work remotely and be able to have a better quality of life and see more of your family and enjoy more of your own community. And I would say that was, that's probably the silver lining out of all that and the speed of transition that's illustrated that productivity is is going up and people are still working remotely so to me that's a huge silver lining yeah people can get away from their desk and their boss won't uh, say hey get back here right. yeah dan uh same question over to you uh, much like uh wendy said you know definitely see concerning impact in real estate um but i think if, if i'm picking a a particular segment where there's the potential for high negative impact, it's in um, education. Like just watching how quickly everything had to shift to online learning. Uh, so think about, you know, all of these elementary sc uh, school children, secondary school children, college students, university students are now no longer engaging in the way that they have been day-to-day -day learning for two years of their life or 15 years of their life. I mean, our learning model completely got disrupted. Educators having to, holy cow, how do I engage my students? How do I reprepare my material and make it available uh, in this online uh, format, in this online world? I and mean, that was, it's a shift, it's a big shift. And I can only imagine uh, the challenge. Now, having said all that, the silver lining to this mm -hmm. is this is where innovation can really shine because there's, there are technological answers to all of this. There really, there really, really are. And uh, what I'd like to say proudly for our region, it's probably the same for all of the members here, but we know our people are resilient. Uh, they are capable and they are innovative. So we see this new normal that we're being asked to operate in. And I really believe uh, in the people and they're, they're ready. Okay, just let's set the guidelines, let's set the playbook and we'll reinvent ourselves and operate under this new playbook until it has to, uh, until it has to change or it changes again back to normal. Yeah, spoken like a, like a true innovator. Bill, uh, over to you. Nothing, nothing gets born without blood, really, right? So maybe all of this is going to force the innovation. Uh, they say when you run out of money, you have to think. Uh -huh. So for years, I've been telling rural communities that now with online resources, any local school district could really offer a world-class education by tapping into online resources and teachers around the world and and I think uh, that I haven't seen that happen yet. I, I encourage them to spend more money on education than hockey camps, but uh, that doesn't go very far. But what I do think, Yeah, I, especially with two Canadians here, I'm wondering what they're thinking about that, but you're right. Well, Minnesota, we call ourselves the land of hockey. So in Minnesota, it's quite farther north than 
Windsor. So <laughs> the, um, um, but we, uh, I, I think, think I just heard a challenge from my seen, friend Bill. What people have seen now with the uh, uh, online learning is that maybe they don't need to look to their own school district anymore. Maybe there'll be new online schools that promise a uh, high quality education in a tech centric kind of way. I've seen uh, little videos by high school, you know, uh, introvert overachiever uh, people saying, school has never been better for me than being online. Uh, I don't have to shepherd through laggards who are in my work group. I can just go learn. I can get my work done. And I think there's, you know, you could create a school, whether it's in a geography of a region or in Minnesota or just globally that say, we're gonna pull together kids at whatever level they are from around the area and create an experience that will be immersive in use of technology and geography and science. It's just, a, I think it's just unlimited possibilities there for the right entrepreneurial, whether that's a business or whether that's right. a uh, state of edu department of education. I think it could be amazing. And it wouldn't just have to be for elite students. It could be for students of any given level. So you could use that same approach for kids who are struggling or cultural groups that uh, you could, uh, whether it's Native American kids or whether it's uh, new Americans that give them, whether it's all the time or part of the time, this different experience that would really be exciting. Yeah. I, think, and, you know, I, I agree with what Bill's saying because I think to some extent we've been seeing that happen in, in British Columbia, the schools reopened, but only 30% of the children actually went back. Um, so, you know, they're certainly embracing the online. All the post-secondaries are saying majority of their programming is going to be online going forward. So really quick, rapid transition there uh, with whole embracing a new way of, of learning and living. And I think Taiwan um, have been doing this quite well from an education perspective for some time. Yeah. Um, two things on that is that, you know, one, it, it does allow people to pursue their passions, which, and we know that passion is key to education and, and being informed. Um, secondly, it does disrupt the, um, it does disrupt the traditional model. Uh, nobody's going to pay 75 grand to send their kids to college if they can get that education and learn differently online. You need the infrastructure to enable all of those changes that you're talking about. And Dave, in the minute we have left, what will satellite do you think be doing to sort of evolve and, uh, and to be delivering these new services and truly new ways of, of learning in the culture going forward? Well, I, I, I think, um, you know, what, what our plans are, are illustrative and that is we're going to be launching uh, yet another satellite next year. That'll be uh, 500 gigabits and it's going to enable us to deliver a hundred megabit service plans. Um, so I, I think satellites just going to continue to evolve and uh, offer uh, faster, better, cheaper. I think it's a good way to end it uh, because, again, I think the rural communities will be able to take advantage of that. I think they will continue to grow. We've been saying for a long time, the middle of nowhere is no more. And I think we proved that today. So I, I want to thank uh, Wendy and Dan and Bill and Dave for being a part of this. Um, thank you so much for coming by. And thanks to ICF Canada for their support to learn more about them uh, or to be more involved, talk to uh, John Young or visit icf-canada.com. Uh, if you are into this issue, uh, ICF Canada really is at the center of it. This No Place But Home series is produced as a service to our network of intelligent communities and the movement and followers around the world. And shout out to our series producer, Matt Owen. Please join us next time for another conversation and to see my conversation that I referred to earlier with Pat Shu, who is the executive director of the National Rural Health Resources Center. Um, you can see that at our website at intelligentcommunity.org backslash COVID-19. There's also a blog about my life in New York during the last 100 days. 
that you can read about as well. Uh, and follow us on Twitter at New Communities and Facebook. I'm Lou Zaccarella for John Young and the Intelligent Community Forum, reminding you that there really is no place but home. Thanks, everyone.